everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Suzette, and I am beyond thrilled to be introducing you to our guest today, the incredible astrophysicist, science communicator, and women's health advocate, Sarafina El Badri Nance. Sarafina is here today to talk all about her brand new book, Starstruck, a memoir of astrophysics and finding light in the dark. Starstruck is a science packed, inspirational memoir that details how Sarafina boldly carved out a place in the field of astrophysics, grounding herself in her passion and a lifelong love of the stars. Honest and empowering, Starstruck sits at the intersection of the study of our cosmos it itself, constantly changing, and the transformative experience of embracing resilience to pursue one's passion. Serafina takes us through a multitude of challenges that she faced along the way, including anxiety, sexism, and abusive relationship, to name a few. Serafina was also diagnosed with the cancer-causing BRCA gene mutation in her early 20s and chose to have a preventative double mastectomy at age 26. In this eloquently written book, Serafina takes us all on an inspiring and honest journey through every step of the way with persistence and passion that led her to become the astrophysicist she is today. So for those in the live stream audience, we will have time for Q&A. So please go ahead and submit your questions for Sarafina in the live stream chat at any time throughout the conversation. And now I am so excited to welcome to the, today's talk, Sarafina El Badri Nance. Thank you so much for having me. What an intro, it's Hello. an honor. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time today to share your experiences and knowledge with all of us. Um, Thank you. I'm so yeah. excited to be here. Excellent. So before we dive into this amazing book, for those who are watching who may not know you yet, you are an astrophysicist and you study supernovas. Um, so myself included, for those of us who are not well versed on all things universe, <laughs> could you tell us what is a supernova? I would love to tell you what a supernova is. So I study exploding stars. So stars that at the ends of their lives explode as supernova. And I'm interested in what types of stars explode, how they explode, and what they can tell us about our universe. So specifically, I am looking at really massive stars that explode at the ends of their lives and I'm trying to learn how fast the universe is expanding by studying them. Well, that sounds like a very, you know, just a small project <laughs> to be working on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a walk in the park. No, it's, it's really fun. It's challenging, but it's, it's, I love it. Awesome. And I hear uh, you've done a lot of research on uh, Betelgeuse. Yes, so Betelgeuse is a star in the constellation Orion, so you can see it with the naked eye, and it looks red, so if you go out um, outside at night, you'll definitely be able to spot it, and it's close enough to us that when it explodes as a supernova, we'll be able to see it here on Earth. It'll be brighter than the moon, and it'll last for a couple of months. You'll be able to see it in the day and at night. So wow. it's very exciting. All of us astronomers want it to explode as, as <laughs> soon as, as it can. Um, but we don't know exactly when that will happen. So I have run simulations to try to determine when that might happen. Our prediction is that it won't occur for another 100,000 years or so. Um, oh, wow. But you know, science is constantly, we're constantly iterating on, on um, what, we, what we found. And right now there are predictions that it could happen in the next couple of decades. So I think we're all, you know, on pins and needles sort of waiting for it to explode. Wow, that is, that is quite exciting. Um, and uh, is, I mean, an exploding star just sounds a bit intimidating, um, <laughs> you know? Uh, so is there any like, uh, how far away is it? Is there any risk to, to, you know, watching this happen from where we sit on Earth? Luckily, it's in our cosmic neighborhood, but it's far enough away. It's about 500 or so light years away from us that nothing will happen in terms of harm here on Earth. It'll just be this sort of fantastic, awesome light show that we'll be able to, assuming we're still around, be able to watch. Sure. 
<laughs> for other reasons, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. I love I love to hear that. So, um, when did your interest in astronomy start? Did you always want to be, um, you know, working as an astrophysicist? Yeah, I fell in love with the stars when I was like five years old. Um, I used to stargaze with my dad every night and I would listen to NPR Stardate when I was a kid on the way to school. And I think I just loved feeling small and, you know, the night sky, no matter where you are in the world, you can look up and, you know, sort of appreciate the enormity of the universe. And that was something that hooked me from a very young age. Um, and I think, you know, was, I wanted to be an astronomer or, you know, an astronaut, whatever it was, I wanted yeah. to do something with the stars. That's amazing. Um, all right, let's dig in and let's talk about this amazing book. So to, to kick this off, um, I just really wanted to call out um, the way in which you're telling your story. It is really wonderfully engaging. Um, I have to say, I really enjoyed reading it. It's so beautifully written. Um, and there's this genuine excitement that you're conveying through the pages. Uh, and in particular, you're interweaving complex astrophysics com you know, concepts throughout the book. Um, and so what you're doing is at the beginning of each chapter, you're starting out by explaining some concept in astronomy. And then you're tying the theme embedded with that concept about the universe to aspects of your personal story. Um, so my question to kick off uh, on the book is, did you start out um, knowing that this is how you wanted to kind of shape your, your first book, your memoir? That's a great question. I don't think I knew right away. It was something that I had kicked around in the back of my mind, but something that I recognized as I was starting to consider more deeply, you know, what I wanted to write about, how I could weave together you know, the science that I do every day in the lab with the sort of humanity that is embedded in each one of us. Um, and what I recognized on a high level is that it's impossible to separate these two. You know, scientists are human. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that and that we honor that when we talk about science is a very human endeavor. Um, and then, you know, of course, I love talking about astronomy. I think I, I think it's, you know, every scientist's job to, you know, consider what we're learning and explain it to people who might not have a background in science, because, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's sort of our job to share the magic of what we learn with the world. Um, and then on a sort of deeper level, I... I when I was thinking about the evolution of the universe and the evolution of what I call the universe within oneself, um, there are a lot of parallels and, you know, we are, we are intrinsically tied to the universe. So mm. for example, you know, we are the stuff of stars. Um, you know, when a star explodes, it sort of ejects all of the elements that were deep within its core. And those elements are responsible for forming you know, the earth, the sun, our solar system, us, the calcium in our bones, the oxygen in our blood. Um, so there's, there's sort of a poetic parallelism in that, that I was interested in exploring. And the more that I, that I sort of wrote the prose, the actual stuff of my life, there were these natural tie-ins with the astronomy, um, more cosmic stuff that, you know, I study every day. And that was really exciting to me. I love it. And you beat me to it because I was actually just about to read that passage from your book, We Are the Stuff of Stars. Um, so, you know what, let me just, I'll just uh, I'll reread it just because it's so beautiful. I, I love the way that you did this. Uh, we are the stuff of stars, the oxygen we breathe, the nitrogen in our DNA, the iron in our red blood cells, the calcium in our bones, and the carbon in our cells were once formed in the cores of stars. Without supernovae, there would be no you, no me, no dancing, no breathing, no words on this page no leaves blowing in the wind, no joy and no heartbreak, no thoughts and no love. There would be no light. Instead, because these stars died, the universe is alive. It's just so perfect. <laughs> thank you. No, I mean, I thank you for reading that. Yeah, I, of I, course. I still get chills when I think about, you know, 
often we we talk about the universe as though it's something that's out there, right? And yeah. it's a little inaccessible in that we can't touch it, we can't taste it. You know, we have to try to understand it essentially through our eyes. Um, but there's something that brings it home when you consider that we are part of the universe and the universe is part of us. And that's a, a theme that I really wanted to explore in the text. Awesome. I love it. Um, and so alongside uh, the telling of your story and, and explaining concepts, um, you're really uh, writing in a very honest way. Um, and you're detailing a lot of the struggles <laughs> that you had to encounter that, um, you know, led you to where you are today and how you got through them. Uh, so talking about hurdles, um, again, you, you pretty much talk about this on every step of your life from childhood to now. Um, and you mentioned uh, from a young age, you encountered pretty blatant discouragement um, from people that you actually looked up to. Um, and just to throw out a couple of the disheartening examples, um, some words from a teacher implying you'd never be good at math because of your gender. Um, and you des you described a crushing blow <laughs> in your first encounter with an astrophysicist when you were a young child who basically said, this is not for you. Um, so how do you get from that environment to a place where you're publishing a book, you're in your career and you're able to, you know, get to the other side of that after you've been through such a level of discouragement when you were a child? You know, I think those examples, that sort of explicit barriers that pop up, you know, in, in one's life and in one's career, I think those are important to outline because they're universal. You know, we all yeah. have different examples of encountering somebody who told us, um, you know, that we're not cut out for something, especially if you are uh, a marginalized identity. So, you know, in tandem with those obstacles, I also had, you know, incredible mentorship by my, my dad was probably my number one cheerleader and mentor. And then I also had several teachers who saw me as the full human, you know, not mm -hmm. just somebody who solves problems or who was good at math or not good at math. You know, they, I think, were able to sort of cultivate a sense of, um, you know, passion for the subject matter because they were able to see me as a full human. Um, so I had wonderful mentors and that sort of brought a sense of community, I think, that I really needed to be able to continue um, in the field. But I also, and I talk about this in the text, I deeply, deeply, deeply leaned on my love for the stars and yeah. that passion really I think didn't just interest me, but it grounded me when things got hard. So, you know, I talk about being really bad at physics when I was in college and it took me a long time to sort of get my physics legs and, and figure out how to solve problems. Um, and when I was, you know, drowning in problem sets and, and frustrated at exams, I would just walk outside and I would look up and I would remind myself you know, why I was doing what I was doing and why it mattered. I think it's easy to yeah. get lost in the like nitty gritty of, you know, whatever subject matter you're, you're focusing your time on. And the, you know, wonderful thing about the night sky is, I mean, I said this earlier, all you have to do is go outside and look up and, and all of a sudden it's right there. And you remember your trials and tribulations are small in the cosmic sense of things. And that, I think carried me through some of those those challenges. Wow, yeah. And I mean, just to be honest, a lot of people stop right there when you're faced with challenges like that, you know, and that's something that is really good advice for all of us is um, you know, to hold on to that that end goal there and and to to go get outside and look at the stars. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I was so honest and transparent about the challenges is as you said, you know, a lot of people get discouraged and they leave the field or they choose, you know, yeah. something different to spend their time on. And I think, you know, when we talk about quote unquote success stories, it's so important to talk about, honestly, the steps that got one there. And oftentimes yeah. 
you know, people might think, oh, this person, I don't know, achieved their wildest dreams and, you know, they're just, they're just better at it than I am. And the truth is not, that's not the case. The truth is that, you know, I was very lucky in a lot of ways. Um, and I want to provide a sense of belonging to other people who struggle and who, you know, might feel like they don't belong or that, you know, whatever field they're in is, is challenging or they're told that they don't belong. I mean, that, that feeling is, is, as I said earlier, it's universal. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, kind of related to that, uh, feeling too, and, um, you know, being able to like get through things like that. Um, let's talk a little bit about visibility. Um, so you have explained in the book, um, your, in your childhood, uh, there was kind of a void of visible female persons of color, um, you know, that you talked about as a child, you talked about through your career. Um, so what did you think an astrophysicist looks like when you were a child? And like, what has it changed, you know, like throughout your uh, career trajectory to this point? I mean, I didn't see any astronomers who looked like me when I was a kid. I mean, I think, you know, my my image was like Albert Einstein, right? This like older white man with, you know, I don't know, glasses and, and white hair and just is in front of a chalkboard and is a genius. Um, that was my expectation of what an astronomer looked like. And part of that is because those are the images that are fed to us when we're kids. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was fed to me. I only knew of men in physics and astronomy. Um, and I, it hit me a couple of years ago, sort of at the beginning of grad school, when I was asked who I looked up to and I couldn't think of a, of a woman, especially a woman of color in this field. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, I, yeah. at first I was like, what's wrong with me? You know, why can't I think of anyone? And then I recognized, well, I have never been showed those people. I have never like learned about people who do make advancements in science and technology. Yeah. There are many, many women and, and women of color who do so, but they're not platformed in the same way that white men are. Um, and I think once I recognized that, you know, that was a light bulb moment for me in terms of recognizing the importance of representation, because I felt out of place so often, um, you know, as I sort of continued in my career and carved out a place for myself in physics. I mean, yeah, I, I felt out of place in large part because I couldn't see myself in it. Um, yeah. And that's it, it's part of my mission to try to change that. Excellent. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, do you are there ways in which you're bringing like your younger self to your work to try and say like, well, I would have rather seen this when I was a kid. Like I need to be, you know, speaking out and, and you're, you've published a book and you're, you know, like using your, your ability to uh, have a platform to hopefully change that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, uh, you know, I wrote this book in, in some ways for my younger self, you know, I, I wrote the book and, you know, I do the sort of, representation advocacy for younger Serafina who didn't, you know, see herself in, in these fields and, and doing these, these things. Um, and I, the importance of that is sort of highlighted every time somebody reaches out, reaches out to me and says, you know, yeah. I, I, I saw your story and it, you know, encouraged me to stay in grad school or it encouraged me to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I think, we have there there is a a common stereotype that women just aren't interested in stem fields um mm -hmm. and that's why there's this you know lack of of women in stem and you know that's that's really not the problem the problem is that women and and people of marginalized identities are pushed out actively pushed out of these fields um you know they experience explicit things like we discussed earlier, harassment, um, any sort of bullying, et cetera. But there are also, you know, if they don't, if you don't, if you don't see yourself in something, it's very hard to be in it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I try to be in short, the woman that young Serafina would have wanted to see, um, you know, when she was a kid. Awesome. 
And related to visibility is another topic that you you bring up in the book as well of uh, imposter syndrome. Um, so something that we've all experienced, I would say, um, and just how important is it to challenge doubt, both the doubt that's coming from the external sources, like we mentioned, as well as that doubt within yourself. Do you have like advice for how you're how you've managed to battle that? Um, therapy. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, great. <laughs> no, you know, I I I think what's interesting and something that I explored a little bit in the book is how these explicit messages become sort of insidious and embed themselves in one subconscious so that all of a sudden when you start thinking, oh, I'm not good enough for something and you can't untangle your own belief from what you have been told by mm -hmm. others. Um, and it's hard to recognize. I mean, that's a voice that um, has a lot of power. I mean, it does for me at least. And I think it's a practice to recognize like that's a lie and I'm going to devote my energy towards a different voice, one that has a sense of, of quiet confidence or at least belonging or direction um, that's contrary to the self-doubt and the, the, the other, I don't know, like negative thoughts that one might have. Totally. I love that framing it as it's a practice. That's yeah, it's not it's advice. not something that just <laughs> I wish it just changed. <laughs> but no, I think it's more of you have to constantly uh, listen for it and be aware of it. And you know, I'm paraphrasing my therapist at this point. But it's yeah, you, you, you learn to to recognize it and then choose. That's where the I think the work is, is you choose not to listen to it, you choose to listen to something else. Amazing. Um, all right, so I, I also really wanted to uh, talk about what you called out a little bit earlier, um, the concept of transience and feeling small on your perspective on that. Um, so if it's all right, I'll read another brief passage that you wrote because it's so, it's so eloquent. Um, the universe felt big enough that I knew with certainty that my life, my very existence could blink out and nothing would change. The universe would just continue on. And the thought doesn't horrify me. It's comforting, liberating, even a reminder that our transient, our atomicity doesn't diminish how precious we are. It's simply that there's so much out there, timescales we can hardly fathom, and our existence is an exquisite blip. We are the single cell of an enormous giant, 10 giants, 10 trillion giants. That's one it. of my favorite passages. I'm so glad you read oh, that. Great, I'm glad. So yeah, can you... Can you expand on that and that feeling the first, like the first time you really, um, you know, kind of latched onto that perspective of like, you know what, whatever is happening, there's so much more to the story. Yeah, I think, you know, we just talked about imposter syndrome and, and these sort of negative beliefs about oneself and you know, as you, as you mentioned, that's something that I've struggled with for a long time. Um, you know, I have pretty severe anxiety and I think even at a very early age, I recognized that this sort of turmoil that I felt internally, um, was, I don't know, there was a ballast to it. And that ballast, ballast was the night sky. Um, you know, when I, walk out and look up, it's easy to just say, oh, you know, those are stars, those are planets. But really, when you start to contextualize what you're seeing, yeah, and you think about the distances and the timescales that we're talking about, I think it's impossible not to recognize the vastness of the universe. And, you know, not only are we a blip in space, but we're a blip in time. And in many ways, those things are intertwined in this thing we call space time, the very fabric of our universe. And for me, there's a beauty in that. That perspective is, interestingly enough, even though it's embedded in something that's out there, it's very grounding for me here. Um, and I think there is a response to it that might be, you know, why does it's sort of nihilism? Why does any of sure. this matter? Yeah. Um, but I think it, for me, 
it means that everything is infinitely more precious. You know, every conversation you have, every relationship that you spend your time on, those are where life holds meaning. And I think it's, it's, I find that it's easier to appreciate those moments when I recognize that they are, they're small and they're brief, but they're beautiful. I love that. And it's, it's really something that I think, you know, is a great reminder for a lot of people um, to really understand that, you know, be in the moment kind of mentality as well. Exactly. Um, so let's pivot a little bit and we can talk a little bit about uh, another really uh, important topic. Um, so you are a very vocal advocate for women's health. Um, and you personally had gone through um, a, a health experience where you learned that you had the BRCA gene mutation um, and decided to pursue a uh, double mastectomy. Um, so can you talk a bit about that experience? Um, what were the risks that come with that gene mutation and the context that made you decide to like get tested and find out even? So my dad was diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer when I was in college, and it was a very aggressive, um, fast-moving cancer for him, even though generally prostate cancer doesn't tend to behave that way. So because of that, and because his mom, my grandmother, had ovarian cancer several decades ago and ended up passing from pancreatic cancer, his oncologist suggested, heavily suggested that he get genetic testing. And he came back positive for the BRCA2 gene mutation. And shortly after his diagnosis, um, I too got tested and came back positive. And for me, my lifetime risk from that uh, mutation is that I have an 87% risk of breast cancer throughout my life. Wow. And a 30% risk of ovarian cancer, um, amongst other cancers. So, yeah, I mean, when you consider 87% risk, for me, that was, I mean, it's it's sort of an inevitability at that point. And yeah. I basically started the monitoring protocol that was recommended, where I would get an MRI every year. And... Um, Basically, they found something immediately when I was 25, and I was so anxious, speaking of this sort of, you know, these negative beliefs and this, um, yeah, fear. I, yeah. Um, it, I thankfully, it came back benign, but after that experience, they wanted to monitor me every six months. And to me, that was untenable. I, I couldn't imagine living in fear and essentially waiting for cancer to rear up in my body. Um, yeah. Yeah. Talk about anxiety. That's yeah. like another layer. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and so my oncologist, you know, brought up a preventative double mastectomy and that would lower my risk from 87% to less than 5%. Wow. Um, and I mean, you know, as a scientist, I mean, the the statistics were just overwhelming. I mean, it was like, why would I not pursue this, sure. right? Yeah. Um, so I immediately uh, basically found a surgeon and that was a whole process in and of itself. You know, I was very young. I didn't yet have cancer. And so um, that was a, a lesson in learning how to advocate for myself um, and my body and my health. And... Um, you know, found someone who was amazing and ended up getting um, three surgeries in one year um, wow. as part of that process. And um, yeah, I, I think I, I share it because I think it's so important for people to know that knowledge is power. Um, you know, I think as, as yeah. scientists, like that's sort of a baseline level of, of science literacy that I, I think is, is important. It, you know, equipping yourself with the knowledge to be able to advocate for yourself, your body, your health. Um, and, you know, 
I've had many people come to me and say, you know, I didn't know genetic testing was possible. I didn't know that, you know, I could, I could learn this about, about my, my health. And, um, yeah, yeah, I hope to, I hope, I hope to help other people, um, on similar journeys. That's, that's awesome. And, uh, to be able to, I think you detailed some of this in the book too, of like, you know, sharing your story on social media and just the volume even of people coming out of the work being like, Hey, thank you for mentioning this. I, you know, have a lump. I should get this checked out now. Like that kind of immediate, like you're helping somebody, you know, actually pursue, you know, figuring out what's going on is really important. And, you know, that sharing that experience matters like so much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't know that that was going to be the response. I mean, it was completely shocking. Um, but the more that I talked about it, the more people I recognized, you know, didn't know to do self checks, for example, sure. or didn't, you know, it's, it's women's bodies are often not talked about in this way publicly. And I think, you know, dismantling the taboo around, you know, women's breasts or, or just, you know, healthcare in general, I think a lot of it is, is very like, no pun intended, but like close to the chest. And like, yes, I, I, we can't do that. You know, when we talk about like healthcare, we talk about, you know, self-advocacy. I think it has to be something that is not, you know, cloaked or, um, you know, I don't know, yeah. done behind the scenes. I think it's important to call it what it is and be transparent about it. That's that's a really great thing to be doing. Um, and I think you, as, as we've seen, will help a lot of people even just by sharing that. Um, so let's pivot right right back to some, some science. Um, so you've done something that not many people can say they've done, um, among a lot of things, but... Um, the, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, your experience as an analog astronaut at the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog Simulation Program. Uh, so tell us all about that. What, how did you decide to do that? And um, what was that experience like? Um, so at the beginning of COVID, I applied to NASA to be an astronaut. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, I was like, you know, I've had this dream since I was a kid. Let me try. And to nobody's surprise, I didn't get it. But (laughs) what I learned from that process, you know, is several hour application. And they ask you to share, you know, experiences that you've had that might be helpful for um, astronaut training. And I was reflecting on the fact that I have quite a bit of research experience and, and, you know, specifically, you know, astronomy, but I didn't have as much experience in, you know, these other realms of, of astronaut, I don't know, world than that I, I wish that I'd had. Um, and so that was sort of the impetus behind exploring other ways that I could challenge myself and, um, start to pursue this dream more seriously. So this analog mission that you're that you're referring to was um, a mission in um, on the, the top of this volcano in Hawaii. And I basically lived as though I was on Mars. Um, I lived with a crew of five and we, yeah, I mean, we, we tried to live as closely to what an astronaut might experience on the red planet. Um, wow. As, as we could, we had freeze dried food, we had rationed water, we, you know, had to wear spacesuits every time we would go outside and perform research activities or experiments. Um, there was a Martian time delay for all communications with earth. Oh, wow. Um, so it was a very, I mean, it was, it was as close as, as you could really get to being on Mars without actually being on Mars. That's really cool. And like, what was, I mean, what was a typical day like when you, when you were there? So we would, you know, make breakfast out of this disgusting freeze dried fruit food. I cannot, it's, it was so bad. Um, and then, you know, we would, we would do our own research for a little bit. And if we were approved by 
um, the command center, we would go outside and I, I basically used a spectrometer to analyze rock formations um, and learn what types of elements were in them. And a lot of our down, quote unquote, downtime was was just making sure that the hab where we lived was like livable and functional. So it was a lot of just maintaining the environment that we were in so that we could survive on Mars. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was it was a lesson in learning to live with other quote unquote astronauts, um, other people helping other people with their research that's completely outside of my realm of research. Um, and then just learning to survive. That's awesome. And I guess that's a good segue too to to talk a bit about um, technology. So in the past twenty years, from when you were a kid to now, um, a lot has changed. And um, in terms of what you you know started out doing to now, like how has uh, technology or has it impacted your specific uh, area of research? Yeah, so I do computational cosmology. Um, and I mean, the, the title basically says it all. I rely heavily on um, advancements in tech, uh, specifically in the computational space um, that I don't think existed anywhere close to, you know, where we are now 30 years ago. 20 years is very kind. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I... I think that astronomy as a field has really sped up um, exponentially, as with has has a lot of other STEM fields. Um, with the advent and, and development of, of sort of cutting edge technologies that make it possible for us to manage big data and you know perform simulations expeditiously, and I think really. Um, capitalize on on the enormous amounts of data that we're getting from our telescopes um, and our research facilities every night. Um, you know, especially when you think back to what astronomy was like, oh God, like 60 years ago when we had actual plates in our telescopes. Now we have CCDs and we have, you know, much, much better tech that allows us to probe, you know, these sort of deepest, darkest um, parts of the universe um, that we couldn't really remotely touch, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's completely, completely dependent on the advancements that are that are happening every day in the tech space. Awesome. I love it. Um, so I think we, we might have an audience question or two. So um, before we jump in, um, I'd love to ask you to you've already accomplished so much and you're truly still at the early stages of your career. Um, what is next on the horizon for you? Oh, uh, I never know how to answer this question. Cause I'm like, ah, I just you also wanna... don't have to answer it. Whenever I'm asked like the next five years, I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I think I've sort of steered away from doing five-year plans because I yeah. think it's like, I don't really know what's out there until it's there. Um, but that said, I mean, I, I will always, I think, harbor this dream of becoming an astronaut. So hopefully, you know, I'll continue to sort of try to reach that, um, you know, as, as years progress. I There have been stories of astronauts who have applied to NASA like 10, 15 times. So, yeah. you know, I'll continue to sort of chip away and, and see, you know, uh, what happens there. I think also, you know, the space industry right now is is really booming. And I think there's a lot of exciting advancements happening um, in the space sector at large. And I don't know, you know, exactly where I, I want to sort of like put a poll in and, and, sure. and see what happens. But there's definitely a lot there to be excited about that I would be curious to explore more. Amazing. Excellent. All right. Let's see uh, if we can bring up an audience question. All right, so from Farah, thank you for joining us today. What was the most rewarding part of writing your book? It's a great question. Um, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about writing um, for my younger self, and I think that comes across in a lot of the text. It's it's so honest that I think you really recognize that um, 
you know, in ther- therapy speak, there's like an inner child that is like wanting to communicate and wanting a relationship and, and wanting to understand, you know, the threads that make up a, a one's life and, and making meaning from that. So I think, you know, towards the end of the book, there's this sort of like light bulb moment where I recognize that I'm exploring the stars in the night sky because, you know, sort of how we started, I'm interested in exploring, you know, the universe within myself and those are intertwined. Um, It's sort of this inevitability that I am, you know, deep in the cosmos because I also um, think that there's, you know, these regions of unknown within oneself. And that's essentially what the book is about. And when I, when I recognize that, there was something I think really grounding and really equally exciting about that revelation. Um, and I mean, in many ways, a memoir, writing a memoir was is cathartic. And that was probably the most cathartic moment um, that I hope resonates with people. I, I love it. I, I know it well, which is great. <laughs> um, we might, let's see if we have another audience question. All right, from Lauren. So to piggyback off of that question, um, what was the most challenging part? So there's a chapter uh, about midway, three quarters of the way through the book that um, is about domestic violence and abuse. And, you know, I went back and forth about whether that was something that I wanted to include in the text. And ultimately, I found it really important one because I was being honest in every other part of the book um and it felt like I was doing myself and my story a disservice by not including it but two because I think I ultimately you know these negative beliefs about myself sort of reached a peak at that moment and the environment that I was in with this with this partner um exacerbated a lot of that. And I think I had to reach, I reached a low. um, And then I recognized, you know, I don't deserve this. And I, that was probably the first moment that I think I was able to recognize my agency and recognize my sense of self and my identity and advocate for myself to get out of that relationship. Um, Which that's an incredibly hard thing to do. Like I, Thank Can't you. Imagine. I mean, not, I don't know. Thank you. But yeah, no, yeah, it is, yeah. it's, it, it's extraordinarily difficult. And I think, um, sadly, that's a part of the book that will, you know, relate to some people and, of course, you know, and help it, them potentially, it, you know, that's the hope that is the hope. Um, but it was very hard to write. I mean, it was, you, I'm essentially reliving these, you know, darkest Sure. Moments in my life in service of this, you know, greater goal, which is to help others, as you said, and to, you know, provide a sense of belonging, but also hopefully equip others with a sense of 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 agency. Um, So, yeah, I would say that was the hardest chapter, but in many ways, one of the more important chapters. Yeah. Well, thank you for including that and being very genuine in your, in your writing. Um, I think we have a a time for another question. Let's see. All right. So this one is from Teresa with the universe being so vast and mostly not within our control. Are there elements of this that makes you feel anxious? It sounds like focusing on meaning and wonder helps ground you. I think there are two camps of people. I think that there are people who look to the night sky and you know, when they think about, we only know 5% of everything in the universe, everything else, dark energy and dark matter, these things that we don't know. Um, there, there, There's a sense of, of terror, I think, that can grip you when you realize that we only know so little about a universe that's so big. Yeah. Um, so there's that camp. And then there's the other camp, which I think is one that I'm in, that is like somehow just enamored with that idea that we are so small and we know so little, but that means that there's so much to explore and to be curious about and to, you know, investigate, you know, scientifically, philosophically. I I think that's what excites me. 
So, There's no shortage of things to work on. <laughs> right, exactly. And as, I don't know, I, I think there's something really comforting in that for me. Um, and that's not to say that other people's anxiety is not real. I, I completely sure. understand that too. I think, you know, I feel that about the ocean. It's so big and so deep and so unknowable. And I'm like, oh my God, that's terrifying. But, yeah. um, you know, for some reason, my wires are crossed the other way when it comes to the cosmos. Um, but I think, you know, for anybody who feels that anxiety, hopefully, I, I don't know. I mean, I hope in the text and, and you know, in speaking, there's something that is also exciting about it. You know, we chip away at that unknowable, um, you know, vast universe to to learn things and to, to to learn more about our home. You know, ultimately, the universe is our home and that's something worth investigating and being curious about. Um, and yeah, I mean, learning about the universe, you learn about yourself. Very, very poignant and beautifully said. Um, so thank you again so much, Serafina, uh, for joining us today and for, for writing this book, really. Um, we're grateful for you. Um, and once again, Serafina El Badri's Vance's book is Starstruck, a memoir of astrophysics and finding light in the dark. And it's available now and you can pick up your copy everywhere books are sold. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. It was such Absolutely. a joy.